All right, so thanks everybody for coming today. Oh, microphone. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about privacy and tools that we have for privacy. Uh, I know that Pete Ashdown just gave a presentation on privacy, so hopefully you guys are all interested in that just a little bit. Uh, before I get started, I want to remind everyone, if you're interested in security things, welcome to the security track. You're in the right place. Uh, there's another security conference coming up in October, the 20th through the 23rd. It will be up at Weber State. Uh, if you're interested in presenting a security type presentation like this one or the ones that follow, and you weren't able to get one ready for this presentation or for this uh, conference, you can present at the one there in October. There's a call for presenters going on right now. So if you go to saintcon.org, you can sign up for that. Uh, why privacy matters. Uh, I know you guys probably got an earful from Pete just a moment ago about why privacy is important. And I'd like to talk about uh, two very important things about privacy that I'm not sure if you talked about or not. Um, first of all, uh, identity theft is a big deal, and it's a bigger deal now that the internet is around. Uh, I pulled this information from uh, Stephen Krebs website about all the things that people can do once they hack your email address and the things that they can use that email address for. There are uh, a lot of things that you have that link into your email address. How many of you signed up for Twitter or Facebook with your email address? How many of you have banking sites that send you emails and use your email address? Yeah, there's a lot of things that connect up to your email address, and having that be compromised is uh, a dangerous thing. Uh, a lot of times we, we tend to think that we, we need to take countermeasures against things like viruses and malware, but we don't uh, necessarily consider all of the privacy concerns that may be exposing our information uh, and making our email address or other things vulnerable. Uh, the email address is, of course, only one of the things that you can expose through privacy-related concerns, but it is something that does uh, affect uh, a lot of other things indirectly. And uh, then there's also things like Facebook. I don't know how many of you have seen this image. I tried to get an original source on this and couldn't. Uh, it turns out that if you're not paying for something, you're probably the product being sold. And sometimes that's OK, and sometimes that's not OK. Uh, I think that in the end, the choice about which information you would like to share with other people ought to be yours you should have the privilege of deciding which things you're willing to share and which things you'd rather not. Uh, there is a difference between things that are secret and things that are private. It's okay for you to be able to share things that are private but not necessarily secret, things that you would have in your family or with your friends that you don't necessarily want to broadcast to the world. And a lot of those things are transmitted on the internet freely. Uh, a significant portion of those are transmitted without your knowing. And we're going to talk a little bit about ways to, to mitigate that today. Um, so starting out with, we're going to talk about Firefox. How many of you here in this room use Firefox as your primary browser? Good for you. How many of you are using Google Chrome? Shame on you for coming to an open source conference and using Google Chrome. <laughs> there is Chromium, and Chromium is open source, and that's great. Um, uh, I recommend Firefox for a couple of reasons. One, it is a fully open source project. You can look at the source. Uh, it's pretty heavy. I mean, there's lots of stuff in it. But it is open source. And Firefox and the Mozilla organization have a very um, strong stance on privacy. And their efforts are to protect your private information as much as possible and to give you the option to decide which things you're willing to disclose and which things you'd prefer not to disclose. Uh, I think that's an important. Uh, I think that's an important thing to do as far as an organization, and I think that's important, especially in a web browser where uh, I don't know what your experience is, but I spend a lot of my time, uh, both at work and at home, online using a web browser, and I would prefer to use a web browser that gives me the choice about a lot of things, including privacy. Uh, for those of you who do use Google Chrome, you can Google privacy issues with Google privacy issues, and you'll find a lot of issues that are surrounding Google uh, regarding privacy. How many of you read the, the press release in the last week that said that the Google uh, upper management 
has some communication with the NSA directly and the NSA director. Anybody read that? Yeah, it's out there. Uh, I don't know necessarily what they've communicated about or whether or not that affects you directly, but you should probably be concerned about that and make an informed decision about what you need to do as far as that's concerned. Uh, Google Chrome is a great browser. I think that if you're trying to choose a browser, you should probably choose between Firefox or Google Chrome. I think that Firefox has a better stance on privacy, and I would recommend it for things that you are concerned about as far as privacy goes. Uh, next, I'd like to talk a, a little bit about Lightbeam and Collusion. Uh, Collusion was a, a browser add-on that was developed by Mozilla a while ago, and then they, they incorporated it into a more polished product called Lightbeam. And then another developer forked some of that information and created Collusion for Chrome. So if you are using Chrome, I'm still going to help you today. Uh, what these add-ons do is they present a visual representation of the site that you visited and all the other sites that the information that you present on that site is being transmitted to. Uh, if you'd like to know how is my information being used, where is it being transmitted, these kinds of add-ons give you the ability to see that in real time. It's a really cool thing. It's kind of frightening if you uh, turn it on for the first time and you ha haven't tried blocking any of these things because you realize how far your information is being transmitted, usually without your knowing it. Uh, a lot of these sites are things like trackers and uh, advertising networks, and we're going to talk a little bit about how you can mitigate that in just a minute. But uh, I think as a first step, I would recommend that you try out one of these add-ons, either Lightbeam or Collusion, to determine what kinds of things you're concerned about. Being able to know what information you have that is being transmitted and where it's being transmitted is important. Being able to manage your own privacy, I believe, is about knowledge. It's about choice. If you know how your information is being transmitted, you can make the choice to determine whether you're willing to let your information be transmitted or whether you're willing to give your information to that provider at all. Uh, next, we're going to talk about Adblock Plus. How many of you here use Adblock Plus? Or a, or a similar product, right? Uh, Adblock Plus is an open source add-on for major browsers that blocks ads. And it works in this particular way. You have content delivered from uh, a provider or a website, and the Adblock Plus sits in between your browser and the content provider and blocks things that they've determined to be ads. Now, I know that you're all thinking, why would you possibly be talking about this in a privacy talk? Uh, one of the biggest invasions of your privacy happens to be these ad networks that send you the ads. These ad networks are tracking you in a, a variety of ways, primarily to uh, increase their uh, revenue through different kinds of, of business transactions. They'd like to find out what kinds of things you're interested in and how they can market to you better. Uh, sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes that gives you targeted ads that helps you to understand uh, certain products better that you're more interested in. And sometimes that's not a good thing because it means that you're being tracked in a lot of places and your information may or may not be used in the way that you would like it to be used. Uh, being able to configure something like Adblock Plus allows you to determine which things you're willing to present to third-party sources and which things you're not. Uh, I would recommend, however, that if you're going to use an add-on like Adblock Plus, that you consider two things. One is that a lot of providers of content require ads to be able to provide their content, so make the choice carefully whether you're going to be blocking those ads. And two, make sure that you investigate which things you are blocking so that you know uh, what kinds of things you need to make modifications for to prepare your privacy in the best possible way. Uh, the default out-of-the-box uh, configuration for something like Adblock Plus or a similar thing is great, but I don't think it's enough. I think that you should take the time to investigate how it's working for you and how you can make it work better. Uh, I just recently discovered an add-on called Disconnect. It's for both Google Chrome and Firefox and Safari. I think they might even have one now for Internet Explorer. Totally open source. Uh, the add-on that I used previously for this is called Ghostery, but they both do essentially the same thing, which is they give you the option to turn off a bunch of different advertising networks and analytics and social networks and things like that. 
that are pres present on a number of pages. Uh, Matt, you and I talked about this before. Uh, the way that Facebook sets up their like buttons is unique in that they set up their like buttons as iframes. How many of you knew that? Does that scare anyone? It's annoying. It's annoying. Uh, that means that Facebook has a page on all these pages all over the internet, and it gives Facebook the opportunity to track you on all of those pages. Facebook can know your browsing history almost as well as your browser because of all those little like buttons all over the internet. Having something like Disconnect allows you to turn those things off and prevent your browser from loading that. That way, you can choose which items you would like, which pages you would like to turn the Facebook like button on. But if you don't want to have Facebook taking all that information without your consent, you can turn that off and then turn it on when you want it with an add-on like Disconnect. Uh, Disconnect is fully open source, but it is not free. It's donation based. So if you would like to donate to that project and to charity, they have a, a model for you to do that. But I would recommend that you use this. It's a very, very advanced technology. One of the benefits of using a privacy-based uh, add-on like Disconnect is that it also makes the web faster. Yes? So you said this is just basically like going through your friend's browser to get a browser that's solving? It, it is. Okay. They're, they're very comparable products. Uh, this one is not free to use, but it is open source, which is why I bring it up in a presentation like this at Open West. Uh, I think they're both great products. Yes? Uh, I haven't found a way to do that. If that's true, then great. Um, uh, I, however, would recommend that if you like the add-on, by all means, donate to a project that actually makes sense. Uh, let's support that. Yes? For um, web-based browsers, there's something similar called HTTP Switchboard. Okay. Great. So if you're using a Blink-based browser, there's another option for that, too. Uh, there are a bunch of options out there that do this kind of thing, and you can probably choose the one that you want. I just know that this one is actually a very... Uh, well-polished thing. It's been well-recommended and, and reviewed by a lot of people. Uh, how many of you have heard of Privacy Badger? This is a similar product put out by the EFF that does a lot of the same things. Uh, it's still in alpha, so I don't know how well it works for some of these things because I haven't tested it very well, but it is worth investigating and, and checking out. Uh, moving on, as far as your Passwords, I know that we have a lot of concerns about passwords, and passwords protect a lot of our privacy. And we have a lot of different ways to try and make it possible for us to have great passwords that we can remember. Uh, usually when we have a really good password, it's hard to remember because it's complex, and it's generally very long. Uh, some people have developed a bunch of different ways to solve this. I know a lot of people use something called LastPass or 1Password, which are online cloud storage services that store your password. Uh, I'm a little nervous and leery about cloud storage because of the privacy issues that are, cons that are around that. Uh, if you like that kind of thing, that's great. If you don't, there's a product called KeePass or KeePassX if you're not on Windows that allows you to do that kind of thing and store your passwords locally. Uh, it gives you the opportunity to keep your passwords in a very secure password store, and you can have one password to manage all the other passwords. Yes? So I actually have my um, key pass on, uh, on Dropbox, so then I can have it on multiple places and it's encrypted. Sure. So uh, that, it gives you the opportunity to do either one, right? You could still have it uh, online in a cloud storage, but it gives you the chance to make that choice. Uh, one of the great things about KeePass, if you haven't used it, is it allows you to do a global autotype. Uh, if you're using a Mac, you might need to get a special version of the software to be able to do that. But it allows you to open up the, the application and load all of those passwords, and you just have to press the, some special keystroke that you set up to paste your username and password on whatever site you're trying to visit. Uh, that actually can be very helpful to get around things like keyloggers as well. Uh, next, I want to talk a little bit about TrueCrypt. How many of you have heard of TrueCrypt? How many of you use TrueCrypt? Uh, I didn't think TrueCrypt was all that big of a deal until uh, a little while ago. I went to go get a new power cable for my laptop here. I went to the, the Mac store, and to be able to test my power cable, 
they had to plug my computer into their network to do some sort of network boot to check some firmware thing. And uh, that concerns me for privacy issues because unless my drive is encrypted, they have access to all the files on my unencrypted drive. Does that scare anyone else? That scares me. Uh, TrueCrypt is a, a free and open source piece of software that gives you the opportunity to encrypt a subdrive on, on your drive, and you can actually encrypt a second drive inside of it if you want to. Uh, they use this for things like legal plausible deniability, which is kind of cool. Uh, but it gives you the opportunity to uh, have a particular section of your hard drive sectioned off as like a sub drive, and it encrypts it with high grade kinds of encryptions. You can make the choice of which kind of encryption you would like. Uh, I'm not going to go into deep discussion about what kinds of encryptions you should choose or what kinds are available, but you should know that uh, you can install this and as soon as you do, you can load up whatever drive you want and uh, basically you just type in the password to unlock that drive and it becomes another drive attached to your computer. Yes? Sure, but all, I mean, all of these options are available on multiple platforms for you to be able to encrypt at least part of your disk. If you have certain things like, uh, I know that sometimes I keep my tax information on my computer, and I would like for that to not be vulnerable whenever someone could potentially access my computer, so I can take that information and separate that out from other things that I think are probably okay for other people to see. And then you must have the, the encryption password to unlock that drive and even see those files at all. Does that make sense? Yes? You can also use uh, files as opposed to passwords. Yes, you can use key-based authentication for that. That's very true. Has anyone else used that? It is pretty cool. Um, one of the things that you can do with that, actually, is to take your key file and encrypt that and put it in some place like Dropbox where you have access to that information, but it's separate from where you would be typically putting the drive itself, and you only need to pull it down when you're using it. Yes? Uh, what I like to do with the plausible deniability aspect of TrueCrypt is have all of the directories which store chat histories, browser histories, SSH keys, anything like that, mounted on demand only from a TrueCrypt file. So when somebody boots the file, it looks like it boots the computer. It looks like it works completely but none of the private data is actually mounted. Okay, yeah, that's a great idea. Uh, that gives you the opportunity to do things like that as well, where the data is only available when you need it and when you have unlocked the drive. Uh, <clears throat> next, I, I want to talk about uh, the Linux Unified Key Setup. How many of you read the article on how to nuke Kali Linux? Nobody. This is the coolest thing uh, I have seen on uh, drive encryption in a while. Uh, Kali Linux included this uh, Linux Unified Key Setup, which allows you to do full disk encryption. And it allows you to use uh, keys or passwords or things like that. Uh, it works on multiple operating systems, so you could do this on potentially other operating systems. But they found out that if you created a Linux Unified Key Setup on Kali Linux to encrypt your entire file system, and then you take the, the representative key that unlocks that and delete it, that it effectively nukes your entire hard drive and no one can read anything. If you take that and you store it somewhere else, then you can restore it later on and your hard drive is back to normal. Uh, a lot of people have discovered that they can use this for things like when you're taking a trip on an airplane and your computer needs to be out of your possession for a time. If you want to make sure that no one can read your data, this is a great way to do it. The reason why is because you can ensure that the encrypted hard drive is encrypted with a key that isn't present with the thing that you're trying to ship, and you can pull that down from the internet later on. Just don't lose it. Just don't lose it. Uh, if you do lose it, you're in a, a whole lot of trouble. Uh, and this is why great, uh, I, it's a great idea to do some sort of like external backup, uh, perhaps to a cloud service if you're okay with that, or to some third party where you can have that maybe given to you later on, and you can you know, restore it or re-encrypt it later or something like that. Does that make sense? I think it's super cool. Uh, for browsing, how many of you have used Tor? Or Tails or Orbot for 
multiple platforms. Uh, Tor is a really cool thing if you haven't used it before. Uh, it allows you to anonymously change the, the way that you're accessing a, a particular server and the only unencrypted traffic is from the end of the chain to the destination server. Uh, it was developed by the Navy. It's incredible software. Uh, I know that there have been lots of uh, issues perhaps surrounding that with the NSA and the way that they have potentially broken that network. Uh, I don't know that I'm as concerned necessarily about whether or not the NSA has broken that, but the opportunities that this affords us as far as privacy is concerned. Uh, using this kind of connection over SSL gives you an encrypted connection that is randomized to the point where typically even your ISP can't necessarily know what you're trying to do. Uh, it is a privacy option. I don't know that it's the greatest privacy thing ever. Uh, it was assumed to be before. I think that that's probably debunked at this stage. But it gives you the option to have your information transmitted in a more secure way than not using that. Yes? It is really good for, good for getting through firewalls at work. Um, I'm actually going to talk a little bit about that on uh, Saturday in the parents' presentation about how if you set up a, a firewall or filtering on your internet connection and kids end up installing Tor, that won't work very well. Yes? Um, I don't necessarily know that I can comment on that, so I wish I could. The, di the difference is, is you've got multiple nodes in Tor. Um, it's not like you're going through a big chain like Tor is. So, but if Tor is not a threat model, are you protected against the wireless network at the, pet, at the coffee shop or your I I ISP? Or are you protecting against, I don't want that server to know, or, right. or, the, or the NSA to know where it's coming from? I mean, yeah. they're, they're protecting against your system. Because Tor, literally nobody in the chain has to tell you knows where you're going. It's, that's the idea. But there is actually nothing necessarily preventing you from using both. You could use a VPN and Tor simultaneously. Sure. Uh, the, the idea is that uh, I think that privacy is important in a lot of ways. And one of the ways that you can make privacy work for you is to use multiple tools to create the most uh, choice for you as far as a user, right? Being able to use two things or three things to mitigate privacy issues for you personally is helpful. So it's OK to use both. Uh, other things that help you with privacy, OpenSSL. Two thirds of the internet uses that. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of Heartbleed. Bye. Hopefully. If you run a server on OpenSSL and you haven't updated it yet, you're probably already exploited. Uh, so please go ahead and do that. Uh, if you have updated your OpenSSL and you'd like perhaps a better option, how many of you have heard of LibreSSL? Brand new project, right? Uh, I learned about it from the OpenSSLRampage.org website. Uh, this website has some interesting information on it. Uh, if you'd like to learn how to code some C code it more securely, the OpenBSD guys are commenting on the OpenSSL stuff and how terrible some of the things in there really are. But they have improved OpenSSL in a lot of ways, taken uh, an open source project and forked it to another open source project. Uh, I don't know how mature LibreSSL is just yet, but uh, it started out as OpenSSL, so it has some maturity uh, at the beginning of the project. But it, it is a an interesting idea to take uh, an already very successful product and fork it for another hopefully successful product. Uh, OpenVPN, uh, we talked a little bit about VPN. Being able to use a VPN can be uh, a tool in your arsenal to increase your privacy. If you have something on the other side to connect to that you do trust with your privacy, using OpenVPN can help you with that. Or if you use OpenVPN to set up the privacy on the other end, if you want to encrypt traffic from one particular place to another, this is another way to do it. Uh, how many of you have used a VPN before? 
please let that be everybody in the room. Uh, VPN is a cool technology, and it gives you the, the option of setting up uh, a very trusted network between yourself and a particular server, uh, giving you the, the option to contain your privacy into that tunnel. That's a great thing. Uh, next, how many of you heard of Prey? Two, three, great. How many of you have heard of uh, software to track your devices like iPhones and iPads and computers? What do you guys use for that? Lookout. What's that? Lookout. Lookout? Okay. Open service. Okay. Um, Prey is an open source project that doesn't have as many features as Lookout. It's simply to track your devices and possibly uh, wipe them or things like that. Um, this is a, a screenshot that I took from Will. And uh, it gives you the option to do alarms, alerts, uh, GPS tracking for your device. Um, one thing that I would caution you about the Prey project is that for most devices, it doesn't allow remote installation. Uh, I know that with things like Lookout, you can install that through your Google account or your uh, Apple account to the device and use that to track the device after you've already lost it. Prey has to be installed in advance. So if you're going to use that to track your device, <coughs> potentially for when it might be stolen, installing it now would be a better idea than waiting until after it's stolen because then it won't work. Um, why does this matter to privacy? Well, uh, I don't know about you guys, but I happen to have a lot of information on my phone that I'd rather not share with everyone in the world. Um, contact information, text messages, emails, things like that. All those things are available on my phone. If you think about the other possible ramifications of that, uh, if you have like Google Authenticator types of things on your phone, what kinds of things can someone access if they happen to get your phone and or compromise your phone? It could be pretty bad, right? Yes? Where do they store the data of where your phone and is? Can you, um, in other words, can you have that information go to, to a server that you control? You potentially can, I believe. I think they have an option for that. Um, the Prey Project actually has a really nice privacy policy as well. So I would recommend that you read through that. I don't know that I can speak for their organization, but it's worth checking out, and it's not too long either. Yes? Is Prey being used as a Google Authenticator and don't use another site? I'm sorry? Which site do you use that use Google Authenticator and not another authentication site? Most of the sites that I use don't use Google Authenticator. So I, I, I agree with you. That's, that's a very interesting point in that if your Google Authenticator is compromised, you technically, for most things, have to have two-factor authentication, which is very important. Uh, having two-factor authentication is great. Uh, but the point that I'm trying to make is as far as privacy is concerned, you could be compromising half of that already, and who knows what else is on your phone. Yes? Uh, that's not in the context of this talk, so maybe we can talk about that later. But that's a, a great question. Um, how many have used uh, Red Phone or Text Secure by Whisper Systems? People who are running Android, no doubt. Uh, those of you who are running iPhones, I hear it's coming. Um, this stuff is super cool. Uh, if you have a peer who's also using Red Phone, in the middle of a call, you can Upgrade your call to a secure call over VoIP using uh, pre-exchange keys. That is great. It's super cool because you know for, for a fact that your call isn't being listened to by someone else due to the encryption that's on, the, on that. Yes? So does that mean it, it switches from, like, to the data? To a data yes, it does switch to the data connection. Okay. It does not go over the network connection as far as the, the cell towers are concerned. Will it use Wi-Fi to switch the connection? Uh, I believe you can. I, I don't have a great deal of experience in there because typically when I'm actually using this, I'm not sitting down in a place where I have Wi-Fi. So I can't speak to that uh, exactly, but I'm pretty sure that you would be able to due to the way that it works. Uh, essentially, Text Secure is a, a product by the same organization that gives you the same kind of thing for text messaging, meaning you exchange keys in advance, and then you can send securely encrypted text messages that can only be read by the two individual parties. Yes? Without the other person having the same software. They do need to have the same software. Yeah, it's going to be open. 
Right. So uh, it is p a potential risk for if you're sending a text message to someone else, if their phone gets compromised, that you could have your information on their phone as well. So that's definitely something to consider. Yes? At the very least, you have to go also encrypt your messages. Right. So you, would, you, you do have the option of securing that and requiring some kind of authentication to get to that. Anyone else over here? Yes? With the secure call, though, that, that encrypts the packets sent over VoIP one way, no matter what, but they would have to have red phone in order to have their end go back? It doesn't encrypt anything without both ends having it? Um, both ends have to have it, yeah. You have to have the key exchange first because it's, uh, it's a key-based encryption. Anyone else? Uh, so yeah, there, there is a downside to this, which is it's not on uh, Apple devices yet. So for those of us who are using Android, this is great. For those of us who are using Android that want to talk securely to people using iPhones, this is not so great. Uh, but uh, Whisper Systems is actually working on preparing uh, a version of that for iOS devices. Uh, how many of you use PGP? Great way to encrypt things, especially email. Um, I don't know that I have a, a whole lot to say about that other than uh, it's pretty good. <laughs> and there's a key signing party. Um, <clears throat> and there is a key signing party as part of this track on Saturday afternoon. So if you're interested in becoming part of that web of trust, uh, I believe Aaron Topons is doing that. Yes, yes. So. Um, he does a great job. I've participated in a, a key signing party that he has done before. It's, it's a little bit of work, but it's a lot of fun. And you'll so, learn a whole lot about PGP if you don't know about it. Yeah. So if you would like to learn about PGP, go ahead and do that. Uh, I'm also including two kind of peculiar items as far as tools, uh, as far as my privacy presentation here. How many have used these tools, OptiPNG or JPEG Optim? Uh, the reason why I include these tools in uh, my presentation today is because of things like this. How many of you saw this floating around the internet the last couple days? Geotagging is killing rhinos, right? How many of you take pictures with your phones and don't scrub them after the fact or haven't turned off the geotagging? A lot of phones have that turned on by default. Uh, some cameras even have that turned on by default. If you take that information and post that online, that information is available to everyone. Uh, I, I think recently I, I heard about a news report, possibly even here in Utah, where someone did this and found out where a particular teenager's bedroom was by tracking the GPS coordinates. It's not hard to grab those GPS coordinates and plug that into Google Maps from a picture because it's already part of the metadata. Uh, there are a lot of tools that you can use to scrub the metadata. Those are the tools that I use most frequently. Yes? If you don't have GPS turned on on your phone and you take a picture with your phone, would it have the GPS location? Um, it, it's hard to say because the, it, your application for taking the picture might be trying to use network triangulation. So I can't speak for your particular device. What I would say is that it's worth checking out and taking a picture, examining the metadata yourself, and determining what kinds of information am I posting with these pictures. Uh, a lot of phones give you the option to turn geotagging off or turn geotagging on. Sometimes I think it's OK for you to be able to post, hey, I went to this really cool, uh, I don't know, concert or something, and it was located in Burbank or whatever. Or this is, is a great restaurant. I want to geotag this particular picture with this picture of my food or something. Those are great reasons to leave geotagging on. Uh, if there are things like this where you can you know, increase poaching or your children can become vulnerable to predators because this kind of information is available online, then that's not such a great situation. So uh, what I would recommend is that you simply make an informed choice. Take a picture with your phone or whatever device, pull that picture into your computer, examine the metadata yourself, take a look at it. If you're acceptable with that level of information being transmitted out to the internet, go ahead and post the picture on the internet. If you're not, scrub it first. Does that make sense? Any other questions? Comments? Yes? I just wanted to say, image or also automatically scripts all the metadata and replicate it. Okay, so I, I'm sure there are other services that do that as well. Assuming you trust Imager. <laughs> there is that, but. And you know, the, there, there is that concern, which is uh, Imager strips it before it presents it to everyone else, but who knows what they're doing with the information in the background? You know, there's no way for you to know that. Um, they could be logging it to present to you know 
law enforcement authorities later, which may be a good thing, I don't know. Uh, but if you strip that information out before you upload the, the picture, then there's no risk at all. It's up to you. You get to make the choice. That's what privacy is all about. Uh, how many of you have heard of the Obscure Cam? Nobody. Wow. How many of you have heard of the Guardian Project? Three of you. Awesome. Uh, Facebook facial recognition is really cool, right? Uh, it's also kind of dangerous because this means that Facebook puts all of you to work for their facial recognition system and they're going to outpace the government and the NSA and whoever because they have humans as part of their computing algorithm, right? I can determine that this is a picture of Russell because I know what Russell looks like and I'm going to tag him in everything that he's in and pretty soon I know what Russell's facial structure looks like until he shaves or something like that. Um, Obscuracam gives you the option to scrub photos for particular things. I know that you guys have probably seen things like this on cop shows way back in the day. They did this little you know, mosaic thing on people's faces. That's great if you want to protect the privacy of people in a particular photo. If you don't, then maybe that's not the thing for you. But being able to choose that and scrub those kinds of things out of the picture or make it not able to be recognized as far as facial recognition can be important to you. So using a tool like Obscuracam can help you with that. A uh, couple other things that I put in my honorable mention category of tools that can help you with your privacy. OpenWRT and DDWRT are open source uh, projects for uh, wireless routing on your wireless router. Uh, a lot of the tools that you have installed on the routers that you buy from the store don't necessarily protect your privacy nearly as well as these people do. Uh, other tools that you might be interested in, of course, Wireshark. How many of you used Wireshark? If you're in the security track, you probably should have. Um, <laughs> inve investigating in Wireshark the kinds of things that you are sending over network traffic can be helpful. Uh, if you need some help in learning how to do that, I would recommend that you come to St. Con and learn about that. Um, then uh, scroll out, Pixel Knot and OpenStego are a bunch of other things. Uh, if you'd like to encrypt your data in ways that are a little less uh, prominent. It's called covert channels. Covert channels. Things like steganography are really cool. Hiding messages inside of openly transmitted things it can be helpful to you depending on whatever your audience is and whoever you're trying to share that information with. Uh, other places that you can go to to learn a lot more about how to protect your privacy. Uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I know we've got a representative here. Uh, these guys care about your privacy a lot more than most other entities. They lobby for your privacy with the government and they work towards uh, either developing or helping develop products that, that help with that. Yes? Um, just to go along with that, their surveillance self-defense project is an awesome source for different tools that you can use to make sure everything is encrypted and better. And it's being updated right now. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, and then there's privacy.org. It shames me to think that that's not available over HTTPS. So I'm, I, I've sent them an email to let them know that they should probably fix that because if they're really concerned about privacy, they should probably encrypt traffic. Uh, yes? Um, I2P, I don't know if anybody has played with it. It's kind of like Tor, but it's kind of a closed community. It, Tor is like an out proxy network where you reach some publicly accessible website, but you're hiding your details. For uh, I2P, most of it is like you're inside an anonymizing network overlay and you're here talking with your peers. Okay. Yeah, so, so those kinds of things can be helpful too. And then uh, epic.org and theguardianproject.info. Uh, I would recommend that you check out those kinds of things. Uh, most of all, what I would recommend to you is investigating these tools. I don't know if these are the best tools ever. I like some of them and some of them I'm not as familiar with or I would like to become more familiar with them. But using these kinds of tools gives me a better handle on my own privacy. It lets me make the choice. And really that's what privacy is all about. I don't necessarily want to share everything in my life with everyone on the internet. Some people do, but I'm not that guy. So I don't want to do that. And using these tools allows me to choose which things I'm willing to share and which things I'm not. And that's what privacy is really all about. Yes? Five minutes. Oh, we got five minutes? Okay. Um, do we have any more questions? I'll just open it up to questions now. What are your thoughts on SSH? Uh, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> but 
Um, yes, it's great. When implemented correctly, all those things increase your privacy. Uh, obviously, you know, there are, there are certain risks associated with a lot of those things as well, but uh, the more information you have, the better able you'll be to do that, to, to take care of your privacy on those things. Yes? Uh, in my experience, I have been able to use all of these in Firefox together. Uh, I try to use fewer numbers of these in Google Chrome because I use Google Chrome as my secondary browser. The, I actually want to be tracked on some particular service or I can't use it unless I allow these trackers or those kinds of things. So I load it up in Google Chrome because what do you do? Uh, but I have had great success with using a lot of these things in combination. Uh, I would recommend that you try it out. Uh, if you find that there's a conflict between those things, maybe let the developers for the, these things know or contribute to the open source project yourself. They, all of the things that I've talked about today are open source products. So you can contribute to those things too. One more over here. Okay, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. That is a great question. Um, how many of you here are familiar with Cory Doctorow? Guy with the cape from XKCD, if you're not familiar with Cory. Um, he is an activist for these kinds of things. And one of the, the comments that he, that he wrote as part of a, an EFF release was that uh, all of us are here today because of something that was private but not secret. Meaning we all have parents, we know how babies are made, but that's something that happens in private, right? There's a difference between things that are private and things that are secret. And we all make these kinds of decisions every day of I'm willing to share this with my coworkers, with my friends, with my kids, or whatever. And we also make decisions of I'm not willing to share this with them. I don't think it's ready for me to share with them, or I just don't want other people to know about this. It's none of their business. Uh, really, it's up to you, right? I can't make everyone in the world care about privacy as much as I do and I don't know that it's necessarily my job to do so, but I do want them to understand that the choice is yours, right? If you choose to do nothing, then the choice has been taken away from you. you if you choose to put none of these add-ons on your browser, then you won't even know all of the places that your information is going, let alone how to stop it. So I would say, does everyone care? Maybe not. Uh, I know that a lot of people probably say, well, I'm okay with my information being transmitted all over the place, and I'm not really trying to hide anything. It's not necessarily what you're trying to hide, but what you're willing to give up. Uh, a lot of people are willing to give up a lot of things for a lot of different reasons. People post all kinds of things on Facebook for possibly terrible reasons. And, and people don't necessarily think of the consequences down the road of what you're doing. Uh, that would be, I guess, my greatest motivator for this is when you install some app like Farmville, You've just exposed your information and all of your friends' information to some third party who may or not may not have your best interests in mind. Does that make sense? Yeah. Did I answer your question kind of? Yeah, I just wanted to hear both sides. Okay. Why yes. One more question. Last question. Uh, just tying on to the using multiple extensions in a browser, one thing to be aware of is Chrome and Chromium only allows one extension to modify outbound headers at a time. So if you have multiple that are trying to do that. Another reason to use Firefox. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Your, uh, which one of Adblock was not bought by Google? Because the one that was bought by Google said that they still allow some of their apps. I, I don't know the answer to that. I would suspect that Adblock Plus, since it's open source, is probably not that one. But I can't guarantee that because I didn't know. I I don't use Google Chrome, so I don't know. Quick well, question. I have a concern in particular with. Uh, cell phones because it seems like every application that you install um, has some long list of security permissions and just the sheer number of uh, applications that want to leak information kind of becomes kind of difficult in really installing. What would you recommend for like sandbox applications? 
Uh, I don't have a great recommendation for that. I would say, uh, as far as what I do, I read through those kinds of uh, security requests very carefully and make as best of an informed decision as I can, which is I am willing to let this application have access to this data or I'm not. And if you make that decision, then you, you can always uh, switch from, from using the stock Android over to using something like SiteNotes a lot, um, which then by default you can actually set it so it disables all of that stuff and then you have to go in and enable it yeah. specifically for every application. Okay, so there's another option for you. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, coming to this presentation. Hope you enjoyed it.